I'm going to start the bidding here at five million pounds. Five million pounds. Five million five hundred thousand. Six million pounds now. Six million pounds. Six million five hundred thousand. Seven million now. Seven million pounds. In the art world. We down out. We down out. We down out. In the art world. We down out. We down out. We down out. In the art world. Hey, hi. Welcome again to Down and Out in the Art World. I'm Mike Watson here with Bobby Dowler, and we're going to talk about memes and the art world today. Are memes a new art world? Okay. So we're here broadcasting on the Theory Wave Nights Twitch channel, which will then go on the Theory Wave Nights YouTube. Anyhow, today we're here to talk about memes and the art world. Bobby uh, is going to be going through a few meme accounts with me. The first one we're going to look at is called Freeze. So Freeze Magazine, it's a spoof of Freeze Magazine, but spelled as in Freeze, F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, like this kind of like, uh, you know, decorative pattern that goes around a room that will be a freeze. Um, and Freeze Magazine has been going since the 90s, I believe, it's a very popular, successful magazine, which also runs an art fair and was begun by two people who worked in the city of London. And they have certainly said in interviews I read, I'm not sure if it's a line they still they still push, but they said that um, they basically, uh, they, they started this magazine to appeal to people like them because the art world, I guess, seemed kind of boring and uh, stifled. At that point, they wanted to appeal to young affluent people such as themselves who are looking to engage in art and I guess perhaps buy some art and they very much defined the art world from then on um, maybe morphing themselves as they, as they as they've gone along to suit an art world that's become in many ways more political um, but you know at the same time that political artwork political art world has always been kind of superficial so it's been quite easy I think for this magazine with let's let's say very commercial values to kind of embrace uh, the political turn of the art world and a number of kind of movements that have come out of that, including uh, Me Too and um, a turn towards talking about social class in the art world in recent years. Um, so anyway, this is a spoof of that magazine. So it's very clear to anyone who, who is into art that this refers to Freeze magazine and the irreverent nature of the memes um, kind of clashes with Freeze's very, um, how can we say it, this kind of sincere nature of caring about art and caring about issues pertinent to art. And also, of course, the very uncurated nature of, of, of memes in the, in the sense that memes are something that anyone can make, anyone can like and comment on, whereas the art world is very, is, is very much about expertise, about stratification, about about different levels of, of, of artists who are liked to different degrees and revered to different degrees. So having a meme, about, meme account about, about art kind of inverts that because the thing with memes is immediately that one senses when you think about art is that they do this thing of, of being very democratic that art kind of pertains to, or, or should we say, uh, art ostensibly embodies, the art world ostensibly embodies this idea of democracy and, and art for all. Um, and the me meme sphere kind of does this, but much better. So it, so it, you know, it, it, it's very contradictory. It's very much, a, it's very much a parody of Freeze Magazine and the art world. Just the fact of having art, you know, on a meme account, and, and then particularly, obviously, calling it Freeze. So, Bobby, any thoughts on those uh, first comments? Yeah, I, I think it's quite interesting to to note how many how many followers he has because the art world is a relatively small industry. Uh, I don't know how many people it's made up of. I mean, maybe like a guess could be like five hundred k maximum. I don't know. I mean, it's a relatively small thing, right? Um, and this guy has one hundred and twenty followers. Um, one hundred twenty. One hundred twenty thousand. One hundred twenty thousand. Yeah. yeah. Sorry and um obviously quite prolific uh it seems like he's making these memes quite quickly some of them are clearly very lame but 
I guess that's like part of his aesthetic, right? Yeah, I mean, and also he's using a lot of meme formats that are that are common meme formats that are, in that they're literally memes like this uh, this here, um, this reaction meme. So it's a very basic meme, but it's one it's one that maybe has become so popular because it's very uh, easy to kind of understand. Um, but yeah, also yeah, there's a very rough, rough aesthetic. I mean, he's not pulling out any stops. He or she, they're not pulling out any stops. You know, aesthetically, yeah, I think that is. You're right there, actually. The, the, it runs up against the very kind of clean aesthetic of of the contemporary art world, really pushed by Freeze. You really get the feeling that very clean aesthetic is something you know that that Freeze has kind of fostered. And actually, people talk about like you know the Freeze art fair look, or people who kind of disdain the very clean, easy to sell kind of you know vibe of of um certainly kind of <coughs> some of the art a lot of the art that's come out in the last 20 years they talk about freeze they sort of say you know this freeze aesthetic um so yeah this, this goes in the other direction very much yeah so um let's just maybe look at some of these and they might kind of give us uh, some some talking points Uh, I mean, we can start almost anywhere. So let's just start. Um, okay, well, there you are. I mean, that kind of throws us right in at the deep end because it's Karl Marx. Um, and it says, if you want to change the art world, seize the means of production and become a collector. So, um, I, I mean, on the first instance, you know, so it's saying if you want to change the art world, you need to seize, seize the means of production. So it appears to be very much uh, a meme about, um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the way that, that the art world has become kind of criticized, the way people talk about, you know, the need to change the art world because it's very hypocritical. We talked about this quite a lot. You know, there's a lot of talk about politics and, and the need to share wealth and, and you know, extend culture for all, but actually it's a very closed world that ties in very closely with the world of finance and finance capitalism um, and speculative finance. So, you know, this is saying, well, if you really want to change it, you need to put your money where the mouth is and seize the means of production, which would, you know, normally mean you then nationalize those means or give them to the workers, you know, in some way, and then the workers take the profits. But then it says, and become a collector. So it's kind of, there's an irony there that, um, it, that inverts what's being said. Uh, so rather than seizing the means of production in a sense of, uh, in a communist sense, um, it says become a collector. So I guess, you know, uh, basically it, uh, as a capitalist, if you want to change the art world, seize the means of production, i.e. the artworks, the art materials, and, you know, own it. Okay, so uh, I have a question. So who, who do you think should be deciding and taking care of important cultural artifacts uh, in what should it be like the, the state or in like a, you know, um, from, a from from a sort of like I don't know what is the what would be the communist uh, perspective or what, what is the left wing perspective compared to the capitalist uh, system which is prevailing in the West? I mean, of well, course, yeah, like, countries do have their own, you know, like the UK and France, like they do have their, they do have their, their, um, the, the, the states do, do collect as well, right? Oh, um, well, for, for sure. In a way. Uh, there is a lot of art that's owned by the state, yeah. In many countries, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty much a given that, yeah okay well there is a given that you know, the, the museum should be state but the national national museums should be state run or there should be state run national museums which are publicly funded um and that works very well and can lead to you know can lead to to free museum access as we have in in london for some museums uh often you know museums like the national gallery uh in trafalgar square or tate modern 
um, they have large public collections which are free to get into then they tend to have a, a show which you have to pay to get into um, which is enabled partly from the ticket entrance fees for the I don't know how to make any sense. There's a no, there are no ticket entrance fees. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the, the ticket entrance fees for the, the those shows which you know are ticketed, you know they they the fees I guess cover the uh, the cost of running the show, um, is what I meant. So um, I mean, the, yeah, that that works very well. I mean, it's it's pretty rare. I don't know other countries where it's just totally free to get in the national museum. Is that the case in France? Yeah, similar. I mean, for example, you you have something called the Maison, Maison des Artistes. So, you know, artists, if they are members of that, then they can go to most of the exhibitions free, I believe. Yeah, so okay. we... I, I haven't been there for a long time. When I went to Paris, like last time, I'm sure nearly everything costs something, but the Louvre costs a lot of money, doesn't need to get in. Um... Or is there a free, is there a free section? Um, uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think, you know, if you're part of like this sort of artist, artist or, uh, association, which is kind of like government, you know, thing, or if you're unemployed, then you can go to exhibitions f for free, I believe. But again, okay. there are some private museums as well. I'm not sure if the same, uh, applies there, but possibly it does. But just going back to this meme, um, so is he, is, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it making fun of the art world or is it making fun of Marx, like the Marxist elements in the art world? I think it's pointing out a contradiction. Um, in that, yeah, you hope that, that that's what that would mean. You hope that, you know, the statement sees the means of production would mean take um, control of, you know, the, the means of producing art and then nationalize it. So, you know, they, they were available to anyone and here it kind of inverts that so you're kind of going along with that saying if you want to change the art world then you see the means of production make the means of art production available to all and you're like okay nice left-wing statement then it suddenly says and become a collector so i think it's it's making fun of the art world's hypocrisy but i think also i guess the jokes on left-wing people who would be like yeah right on marxist meme and then they get halfway and they're like oh shit actually you know it's become inverted and it's like a super capitalist meme because it's suggesting collectors should own the means of production so um in a way i guess the jokes on everybody i mean it's, it's not uncommon for a meme that it just plays with your head but the thing that it does is it gets conversation going so there are a number of comments here and there's 2300 likes so i mean no doubt there are perhaps even tens of thousands of people who've seen the meme so anyone who's read it through and understands the terminology on a very basic level I guess will at least be provoked to think about who should own who should own the means of production in the art world. And you asked me that question, I didn't fully answer. Who should own the the art and who should who should have the patrimony of, of art? I mean, I think it works very well when the state the state owns um, important artworks and puts them on view to the public for free, as I'm saying happens in the UK um, with the major collections, um, you know, without any kind of discrimination i mean it's basically that they're free for everyone that the, the large part of the national gallery you know apart from the the, the temporary shows and the tate etc i mean that isn't the case in certainly italy where it costs just a stupid amount of money to get into the the major museums like the maxi museum the modern art museum uh, of the state in rome the macro which is the kind of communal so like the city run uh, museum contemporary art museum in rome and all the other kind of collections like the gallery of borghese the vatican they all cost for an italian and a seen an amount of money because you're, you're often talking like 15 euros upwards to get into these things and and wages aren't high and jobs are scarce um so actually i mean the average artist i knew couldn't really afford to regularly get into you know these kind of spaces um in Finland, actually, the prices are obscene. I mean, Finland is known as having a nice, you know, welfare system, education system, etc. But the museums, the prices are off-putting. I can get in as a as a critic if I write to the uh, press people and say, "Can I get in to look at your art?" But I prefer not to do it because I don't actually want to write reviews that much. So, you know, I prefer not have, having the pressure of of these press people following me up uh, for a review after I've seen the show. 
unless I really want to see unless I really want to write on it. Um, so I actually get put off going in to these places because they're costing nearly 20 euros uh, for the Athenium, which is the kind of similar to the National Gallery in London. It has um, a lot of um, you know, 20th century, 19th century painting as a good uh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, however you want to say it. Um, so yeah, prices can be prohibitive in many places. So I think the state running the, the museums is a, is a good idea. But what Strictly has said here is actually the means of production, which would mean actually paintbrushes, canvases, you know, anything else you make art with. And then what that, what that would enable is for people who can't afford art materials so that, they, so that they can make art to also become artists. So it wouldn't just be people who were rich or clever at getting corporate or sponsorship or, or, or money off collectors who could make big artworks. It would be anybody. So then potentially you free up people um, who might have brilliant ideas but don't know how to get the money. So, you know, Damien Hurst has been brilliant at getting money from from collectors and other, and other sources, corporations, etc., to make very ambitious artworks right from when he was a student. Um, things like, you know, sharks in formaldehyde, um, you know, the famous Damien Hurst pieces. Um, and, you know, I think that's fair, you know, fair play to him. But should it be only people who have the savvy to get money, who, you know, to get money from materials who, who are able to make big artworks? I mean, Michelangelo obviously sustained a good relationship with, uh, with various patrons. And, and some, you know, including including popes, um, including various popes, uh, which is how he managed to end up painting the Sistine Chapel. Um, and the popes at the time were hugely powerful people. They were equivalent to, you know, leaders of, of states, leaders of governments today. And um, you could say again, fair play too. He must have had a way of getting on with these people, even though he was notoriously difficult. Uh, partly, I think the Pope's just liked him because he was so good at making art. But you know, still, there there are a number of people who, historically, who who possibly just haven't been able to get the money for the big works or get the big commissions. And is it not possible that a number of these people are really super talented, and that artistic talent doesn't go hand in hand with getting on with powerful people? I mean, what would you say about that? Um, I think I think. It's a combination of the art, the most articulate person probably sort of wins commissions, uh, et cetera, wins in those relationships. It's not just about like visual articulation. It's also about, you know, doing that in words. And in that sense, there is a bit of kind of almost salesmanship to that. And I think some people that have, uh, that are particularly sort of smart, I guess, are able to, uh, go into some situations and and in, in a sort of more of a long 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 game way of thinking about it so I guess like someone like Michelangelo I think that he would have had strategy and he knew what he wanted I don't think that he was particularly you know politically driven um, but I might be wrong there but I think that you know he he He's he's smart. I mean, almost. I I don't. I wouldn't go as far as to say that he was Machiavellian, but you know, he was certainly aware of like power structures and knew what to say at the right time. And of course, you know, in the end, bowled people over or won people over with with his with you know what he'd made when he showed when he when he showed him the stuff, right? Well, that's for sure. Then that's that's true. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't also know if we could call him political. I don't know an awful lot about Michelangelo personally, although I have, I have been to the Sistine Chapel, like hundreds of times because I was a, a basically unofficial tour guide in the Vatican, for for a couple of years, um, so I kind of I know his work, um, but yeah, he certainly had a way of getting on with the elite. But the question, I suppose, is that. You know what you do if you don't have have that because a lot of um, gifted artists are very um, you know they're very timid people they're introverted um, I mean I think I think he was also awkward and 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 and, and I think he what didn't he didn't have a brilliant kind of social manner but obviously he he had a way of playing it 
Yeah, but you know, maybe not everyone is as lucky as him. But of course, one would we could argue that not everyone is as talented as Michelangelo, which is certainly true. Um, so he might be an extreme case. But it's talking about in general. I mean, because this is what we mean by seizing the means of production would be making the the means of becoming an artist in the first place available to more people. Um, so. Um, you know, I, I think there is something to be said for that because there are so many people who, with so many impediments to them being creative, just don't really get out there because they haven't got the money. You know, they come from a family that's poor. They haven't been maybe taken to museums as a kid, you know, because the family's poor. Um, and even if the museums are free, the family, you know, if they're poor, are not probably thinking, let's go to the museum because they have certain pressures on them. So, you know, by making the means of producing art available to everyone and I suppose by that you would have to include education um, you know uh, you make it possible that the next great artist can emerge um, and, or you, you widen the pool from which the next great artist can emerge but that's arguably what's happened to some degree in the last well since some point in the last century um, I mean education for all started in the ninth in, in, sorry, in the 1800s um but education arts education for all on any serious level must have been post-war i would guess from the 60s 70s onwards um and so you know, that that's the thing though this is mainly contradictory because and this is it's quite kind of handy how we we end up talking about this now because it relates to memes is that if you widen the pool of artists does that increase the quality of art produced um because you know certainly the art world now is a lot bigger than it was in the 70s, I mean, you were saying the art world in total could number 500,000 people. I'd be inclined to agree if you're counting people actually employed in the art world and artists who actually get shows. Um, I guess it would have been, you know, in it, considering also art as we know it was primarily a Western construct that wasn't made and, and exhibited in the same way in non-Western countries. Going back to the 70s, 80s, you're talking about maybe 100,000 people or less, you know. Um, possibly much less. Um, so we have many more people now involved in making art and distributing it and showing it, writing about it, etc. Does that make the art better? I don't know. I mean, because um, that's partly the question we, we, we're probably going to get to with memes as well, because anyone can make a meme and put it out there. Does that increase the quality of what's being produced? I mean, actually, a lot of it's crap and it probably interferes with people really learning to make art because they're just producing these stupid memes and, and distributing them instead um, anyway what do you think about that any reflections on whether art necessarily is, going, is getting better or what mm -hmm. um i think it's too early to tell whether it's actually getting better or not but certainly like it seems that if more people are able to make the work then you're going to have more diverse art being made um, but it, it is always interesting to observe as well, like in tandem with history, you know, wars and technology, uh, scientific innovations, you know, what is actually happening in the artistic cultural realm at the same time. Um, for example, right now in France, I believe that the thing which is being studied at university the most is psychology. And one might ask, you know, why, why in particular is that? I mean, I think that you probably need to be um, quite, you know, on the open side to be wanting to study something psychology and very much so with art as well. Are people becoming more open or are we sort of, you know, is, are, are like, is it, is it, is it something to do with the capitalist Western world? Um, and which also begs the question, where did memeing, you know, begin? And is it, is it like part of, you know, is it part of like the Western, the Western, uh, is it, is it accelerating the Western capitalist tradition? And obviously it's got something to do with digital technology, but could you just give us like a brief <clears throat> history perhaps, Mike, about, you know, where you think like this sort of these memes, where they sort of, where, where they came from, what would have been, I mean, like, you know, you have, let's, let's say like you have this sort of Russian propaganda style, uh, constructivist, you know, uh, works, not, not, yeah, I guess they were constructivist works, you know, where they have texts and they have images and it's also quite radical and interesting. It's not like exactly social realism because it has words on it as well. Do you know the kind of work I'm talking about? 
they have quite yeah, a yeah big Russian, connection about that uh, tape. early early Soviet um, propaganda posters and stuff like that, or, or you mean the actual like paintings, um, yeah. Manovich and such like. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, certainly, yeah, you, you can relate that, I suppose, to the conversation we're having in terms of the democratization of art, because it was art that was uh, was was you know made in line with. Um, with um you know revolutionary politics um but i want to in terms of talking about the progression of memes i want to go back a bit i mean i i would go back to actually where the church split off from or when art split off from the church so art was totally in the service of of the of the christian church uh for centuries so there was nothing there was no such thing as an art that is free and autonomous, and it and expresses some notion of freedom in in you know in the way we 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 treat art today. Or you know certainly you know there was there was no notion of the romantic free artist in the sense there is today. Uh, art was very much about promoting the messages of of the powerful, and they would be about religion, or they, they would be portraits of the powerful themselves, or maybe images of of, of battles. Um, but I would be telling a, a narrative related to to power, and at some point you had a break away from this. Uh, I would say in parallel with Enlightenment, so we're talking uh, late Renaissance to on to the 1700s, 1800s. You have this kind of playing out where artists began to depict things other than than the church and other kind of sanctioned kind of myths uh, from you know from from ancient Greek you know uh, ancient greek myth you had a breaking away from these kind of the, the, these portrayals of of um of religious and academic subjects um and i would say that the history of art ever since then has been one of taking art off its pedestal of art stopping being something that's to preserve of the rich that tells the stories of the powerful and starting to be something that 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 could tell potentially anyone's story or it could be used for anyone's kind of you know aims um, and you see this going on through Impressionism, post-Impressionism. So Impressionism is very kind of scientific. Um, and, you know, it looks kind of expressive. So you look at an Impressionist painting, you're like, is that not something a bit like Van Gogh? But actually the idea with Impressionism is to try and, try to, try and copy the, the, the process by which the, the brain, the human brain, captures and interprets nature and light. Um, but then you get into kind of post-impressionism and expressionism, and that's a move away from that. But impressionism, where it kind of relied on scientific methods, uh, or tried to, you know, to try try to apply what we know of science to to making paintings of nature, that's already a break away from the church. So it's already radical, because you're moving away from a concern with God to a concern with science. Then post-impressionism and expressionism, it starts to deal with how do you portray emotions through through paint. Um, through different uses of colour, light and dark, etc. So you're getting a further break away, and it, it becomes very unacademic, very, very nothing to do with power structures, nothing to do with with um, elite kind of forms of knowledge. You're just dealing with 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 how do you capture the human state. This is what you get onto with people like Cezanne, and then this is kind of further developed by Van Gogh. Then you get onto well, you know, let's get away from even the painting. Let's get away from even this kind of, you know, the, the sanctity of the art object. And you get on to Duchamp and his radical break when he starts to just take objects and declare them, declare them to be declare them to be art. So he takes this urinal and this bottle rack for storing empty wine bottles or bottles in general, excuse me, and um, basically, you know, says this can be art. So you get into a whole new kind of world. We don't even need skill as such so Duchamp would say you, you do need to be a trained artist with an artist's eye then you get on to Joseph Boyce later and Boyce says is a, is a German artist who said um I think he first said it in the 60s uh, we are all artists um so you get you know, anyway you're going on and on but you get this kind of thing of you know taking away art from the experts from the artists with training and giving it to the people okay so you then you get to memes you get, you're getting to a point where anyone can say anything but the, the, the mimic element it, coming from um, Richard Dawkins writing in the 70s in a book called The Selfish Gene basically just means a, a cultural message which spreads from person to person. 
So it could be something you say, it could be a fashion code, could be an image, but it's something which is like a virus, especially like a virus. So it's like a gene, in fact, because genes spread from person to person, you know, DNA. But Dawkins said this also happens with cultural messages. So he invented this word meme based on a Latin word, which meant to copy. And um, that's what we've been left with. But, you know, I'd also go back to another strand, uh, which is the Salon de Refuse, which was a large exhibition held in the 1800s um, in Paris, where basically the artists were annoyed because you could only become a famous artist if you showed in the annual Academy show. The, there was an annual show of the Academy there, the Art Academy, which would basically dictate who then got a collector, who then sold to collectors or, or then got a gallerist, etc. Um, and, you know, a number of artists who were doing interesting things, but were never going to be chosen by the very stifled, you know, dry, conservative, you know, academic evaluators. Um, you know, these artists complained. And the uh, king, well, I guess you would call it the emperor of the time, um, he basically understood what was going on and wanting to be popular and appeal to, to the people and seeing this kind of clash between the, the academy and these new, actually post-impressionist artists like Cezanne, um, he said, well, let's have a show of everyone, let's have a show of everyone who's been refused entry to the academy. So you had this massive show of people who weren't able to get into the official, you know, kind of uh, sanctified um, show selected by experts. And a lot of it was, you know, crap. And some of it was good. But famously, the public who went to see this, you know, their reaction often was to laugh at the things they were seeing. Um, partly because you weren't you weren't seeing um, you weren't seeing, you know, these restrained um, messages related to identifiable religious or mythic themes. You were seeing unrestrained portrayals of normal people and 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 you know also nudity, but not related to 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 myths so you know you no longer had this kind of excuse that you're seeing these things because they relate to a certain narrative that's, that's linked, linked to you know the official power structure so it had a big effect so i think they're the they're the kind of different strands of the democrat democratization of arts and the, the meme culture is definitely an inheritor of this but so is the art you know and so is an art world where you have you know tens of thousands of artists now you know, with galleries making something for their art, more than, you know, a handful, more than a few thousand, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, so, yeah, that was very long, excuse me. Um, but yeah, does that leave you, uh, does that answer your question or does that yeah, kind yeah. of throw up any? That was, that was good, that was good, and I think that would be helpful. For everyone so like a meme in a way is like it's a cross it's a cross pollination of left-wing tradition artistic tradition propaganda political propaganda tradition and obviously you know digital technology but that is that fair to say yeah i would say it's, it's a it's a, it's like this tendency to democratize the arts which actually always is kind of a little bit derailed but there's this impulse to take arts to take the arts easier to say to take art to take art away from um you know experts away from the elite and give it to everyone yeah which like is always say, offset it's always offset a bit by the need of some people to ha you know to feel that art is exclusive and to feel that they're part of that exclusive system so you have this kind of tendency and then the art world's kind of you know, opens up a bit, but then still closes down again in some other way. So it's like anyone can come to our museums, but there's a special part of the art world that you need special entry to, and you need you need special codified languages to understand. So, you know, it, it's kind of weird, and that's kind of where memes come in, because they do, you know, this, they, they engage with this kind of democratization of culture, but they don't have this kind of then this... Um, closing back down which occurs you know on behalf or is led by you know certain critics curators collectors artists who want to feel that they're superior to other people in the meme sphere you can't really have that although you do have pockets of people who think they're super cool and they promote certain memes and they say you know ha ha you know that meme that you're using is old by now you know they want to point to other people making memes and and and, and kind of feel that they they that, that they are above them so in a way they emulate the contemporary art world but outside of it um 
but they can't really do that because I don't think there's any, there's no way you can fundamentally um, claim that there is an officialized sphere of memes. Um, sorry, yeah, go on. Yeah. No, I was just thinking now, actually, like with with some of these with some of these memes, even the one that we were looking at, I was kind of thinking like when he says "seize the the means of production," it almost like is that a pun? Means could it be like memes? You know, well, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The pun, the pun, the pun is the other way around. That you do have people, you do have this kind of saying "seize the memes of production," which is also a book um, co-edited by Alfie Bound that came out, which you actually won a copy of which you never actually got in your hands because you won it when I ran a meme competition once and you somehow won the meme competition and you won a copy of my book and a copy of this book called The Memes of Production, which is probably what you're recalling, kind of. Um, but, the, yeah, there is, there, is the, there is this interplay between this season the memes of production, season the memes. And, uh, and, and this, yeah, go on. Also, I just wanted to say with Duchamp, you know this, this uh, where um, – Duchamp famously defaces uh, a reproduction of the Mona Lisa and it has this sort of, uh, at the bottom of it, it, it has the letters, what is it, Elash, Elash uh, something GQ, but it, it, it translates it in French as, you know, it has the sound of she has a hot ass. Yeah, L H A for for like for English speakers, I think you were like pronouncing it, you are pronouncing the French alphabet, but it's L H O O. Whatever it is, G G Q or whatever, we can we can we can bring it up here. Yeah, um, what what would you call it? Hang on, you call it like do sharp? I'll oh, do sharp Mona Lisa. Yeah. Uh, it was a good like irreverent moment of um, what well, irreverent yeah. moment in the art world, but also I think it got copied multiple times. Didn't it? There were there were variations of it, so yeah, that would but be a meme. The thing about the thing about Duchamp and these works is that they have so many different layers to them and complexities. And what is kind of in contrast, what's interesting about the memes is that they are very pop. At the same time, they're very Warholian in a sense. You know, they're very surface. Yeah. Um, well, this is true. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I suppose that did that has fed into into memes. What's happening here? Uh, Hyperallergic trying to get my email address. Uh, I don't know why. I should have arrived here, but oh, because this is where we can see the image of Duchamp's uh, appropriation of the Mona Lisa, but we can't because we, we don't have enough internet. Um, hang on. Well, I think people are getting the idea of what, what's happening here, or people possibly remember this piece. Uh, all right, I don't know what's happening there. We're not allowed in, in Russian, perhaps. Um, all right, so anyway, it was, it was that just sharp, people, people could see that. Um, I mean, I think this is just very glib, kind of very direct uh, aesthetic um, that, that Duchamp used, uh, which was semi-industrial. In the sense that you know that he used mass-produced um, images like that postcard which he reworked, or the the urinal that, that which we know as fountain, the ready-made piece. Um, that those like Warhol's uh, mass-reproduced piece, or the the, the I mean the screen the screen print. Uh, I'm probably talking the screen prints of Warhol that look like you know mass-reproduced artworks in which were to some degree mass reproduced and the Brillo pad boxes he made. I think, yeah, they definitely played a role, all these things in, in they, they paved the way towards the meme, towards, you know, an artwork which was, which is not related to kind of any kind of high cultural uh, frame of reference. Sorry. Bobby, you still with us? I'm still here, yeah. Um, I'm having tech issues here. That's why I was going a bit quiet. We have um, a tweet which is displayed on this Freeze magazine page. And basically it's an exchange and it says, Art institutions, would you work for us for free? And then like me, I say, what? No, that sounds so exploitative. And the institution says, what if we pay you minimum wage and give 10% off at the museum cafe? And then they're like, yeah, you son of a bitch, I'm in. So, I mean... Not really a meme, but then of course it is in a sense because it has 
three thousand likes. So you know, it, it, a meme means something that goes viral. So in a sense, something becomes a meme, whether it's designed in the sense you know we understand today, a meme is a, is a kind of JPEG which has been match, manufactured on, on Photoshop or something similar. Um, doesn't have to be that. It could just be something that goes viral. And actually, it's been liked by my own brother, who's an artist, funnily enough. Um, at the bottom there, it says, liked by Watsoid, Ian Watson. So also, Mike, was this, um, so this, this, this artist, um, is it, is it true then that he has a, he has a show at the, at, um, a prestigious, uh, art institution? Uh, is it the Bolt, the Baltic, no, um, the Barbican? Uh, who, who's, who do you mean by this artist? Freeze Magazine, at Freeze Magazine. Ah, I don't know. Have you read that somewhere? Yeah, if you go to if you go to um, his account again, at Freeze Magazine, go to the top. Yeah. And then go to the go to the LinkedIn, maybe. Uh, link, no, link tree, yeah. A website yeah maybe i mean maybe it was maybe it was another prank but i looked into it and it seemed to be uh seemed... sen i don't know how you pronounce this but okay seme chevy it's probably that probably means something i'm totally missing the point but okay sem a is an artist and creator with a background in anthropology he is known for running the art meme page freeze magazine he currently works for documenta 15 as a curatorial assistant uh, well, it seems quite possibly yes. Uh, he he has shows, let's say, exhibitions, Barbican. Yeah, solo exhibition at Barbican. Go to the link. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is quite interesting because it's like the 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 establishment has. The establishment, of course, if we're not like just following some sort of elaborate prank, let's uh, let's imagine that we're not, um, because actually, like the website, it seems you know, like the art newspaper have covered it, unless of course, like this is all like more prank stuff. No, I think they, like I think they're probably just the artist probably just is an artist. Yeah, the mean the mean admin is an artist. Yeah, it seems to me to be real. But so so yeah so, what, what do you think about like? that that kind of work being institute institutionalized <clears throat> does that um, kind of like, does that kind of take the edge off of it take the power away from it or does it does it give it more power i mean of course like it gives it you know a bigger audience and it gives it like a um a critical perspective and uh you know it gives it credibility it does um it does raise some interesting questions, yeah. Uh, I think I would all, I always worry that the art world would then kind of, you know, somehow ruin what is good about memes. I, mean, I think that sounds, you know, maybe a bit snobby of me, um, but it's actually, I hope, the reverse. You know, I actually just, I, I fear that the art world snobbery will somehow infect meme culture um, and, and also monetize it which is a worrying thing about NFTs. Although I don't say, I don't think NFTs are inherently worrying, but if you think about NFTs, so this kind of form of, um, of um, you know, selling digital artworks and, and selling them as individual pieces that can be verified as individual pieces, um, thus making it possible, you know, to make money off, off, off memes. You know, this, this does really you know, lend itself to a complete monetization of, of the internet um especially if you see kind of the, the direction the internet has gone from being this kind of you know thing for everyone which is incredibly free and open to the situation where we're all feeding into data capitalism when, whenever we make anything even if we make you know very anti-capitalist statements um you know this uh this does suggest that the the nft technology meeting up with memes might lead to a situation where where memes are commercialized on a large scale um and it would be the art world partly behind that and you can see how much the art world has embraced nft and nfts had a huge potential for you know for allowing you know a, a how could you say uh for getting rid of the middleman getting rid of the expert by getting rid of 
people in the art world and allowing people to sell their work directly online, digital work directly online. And somehow the art world's kind of stuck itself right in the middle there and, and in the forefront of, of pushing NFTs. Um, so, you know, all of this put together concerns me. Obviously, art shows, including internet culture and memes, are one way that the, that, that the meme sphere can be kind of softened and brought into the art sphere. However, um, I think that it's impossible for the art world to dominate the, the meme sphere. It's just it's just too big, and so so much of it just doesn't give a damn about the art world. I mean, you have like things like this meme page we're looking at, and you have you know a kind of trendy meme sphere dedicated to philosophy, which I'm kind of involved in. I, I'm not I'm not trying to be trendy at all. Um, but you have like just most of the internet isn't that at all. It's absolute nonsense, but it's also brilliant because it's nonsense. You, I, I like looking at a lot of the really crappy pages. You know, they say like, you know, look at this, um, you know, this uh, celebrity now. You know, this was in 20 years ago. What's happened to them now? And you go through all, like 50 different celebrities on a really badly made web page, um, which is almost impossible to navigate. But you, if you can get through it, you, you see them like side by side as they were in 1980 and as they are now. And it is rubbish. But I can get really lost in that like a wormhole. Um, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, the, nor the normie internet, uh, normie meaning like normal people, you know, um, I, I actually quite like. And I think that it will be impossible to supplant that. And actually, the, 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 radicalism, the, the radicalism of the internet, it, it really resides in those aspects of the internet. The, the, you know, people who like mod cars, you know, who do, who do up their own cars on YouTube, that's fucking huge. You know, and it's nothing to do with the art world. And I've seen artists who have like got involved in that culture and brought it into the museum, but they'll never be as big as that culture itself. It's it, whenever that happens, it's like the art world is trying to co-op something that's actually cooler than the art world. And you really see it with curators. Like anything they see, it's like, you know, they they might see somebody performing tai chi or some interesting dance routine, and they'll be like, oh, hey, could you come down to the museum and somehow, you know, could you do that in a museum? And you see their eyes light up. But it's, it's when they see something that is radically unaware of itself, that is not trying to be cool, they need to somehow get that in the art museum. Um, and that's, I think, what's happening with memes. But the thing is, they, they can't actually do it because, as you said before, the art world is tiny. And there is a, here's where the contradiction resides, that the art world wants to be tiny because it wants to, you know, it wants it's full of people who want to feel special. Um, so by its own rules, it can't ever really supplant the things it tries to bring into its sphere. You see what I mean? Yeah, I think that's got something to do with this like high art and popular culture um, debate. Because, yeah, the art museums, um, of course, like like we were saying, I mean, they're state they're state owned, so essentially they're sort of like owned by the people. The collection is owned by the people, but then you have the vast majority of the society who basically couldn't. They don't really care about that kind of art. They find it snobby and annoying because, you know, they're just they they're not interested in Marcel Duchamp or trying to get to the bottom of that stuff. You know, it's quite cerebral, or even like impressionism or Van Gogh. Um, they could they seem to be able to appreciate like Renaissance art, even if like they don't have the experience of seeing it. They just it's just considered like so much part of the canon and it's so obvious that it's meticulous that it, that you know, people just the general public seems to even get that kind of art or accept it. But that's I don't know if that if that was exactly the same thing at the you know at at the actual time that it was made. Probably it was, but I don't know. I don't know how many peasants were going to see the Sistine Chapel. I'm not sure. Maybe religion kind of guided people into that zone. But there would have always been you know gypsies that had like their own you know, roaming culture and that we're not engaging in that in that so-called high art. But then, so with the popular culture, the museums are always trying to get popular culture into the museum so that they get more and more people in a wider variety of people so they can say, yeah, you know, this is a place for all of us. When in fact, it's not really, I mean, it's kind of like a place for curious people to go and occasionally you will have like a, an artist who's not really from a family who's that interested in high art that may go in there. I mean, I, I'm one of those. I think you are as well, where, you know, we came across art in maybe like a ser serendipitous 
uh, sort of chance encounter, and then we sort of you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then it's then it sort of like opens up our curiosity, and then we get obsessed. We move on from something like I don't know video games or football or Barbie dolls, you know, whatever, and then like you get a new obsession, and then you know that can end up having a huge influence on your life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, certainly the art world kind of brings people in in that way. Uh, I mean, that's, as you say, more more the role of museums and, and state museums. But, they, you know, they're very, I think people are very much aware that they're coming in, you know, at the entry level. They're, they're at the monastery sweeping the steps before they're allowed in to begin their their spiritual practice, if you were going to compare it to, you know, Karate Kid or something, you know, becoming a, I don't know why I compare it to that, but, you know, it, it, it's that kind of feeling, you know, that that you have to, you have to do a certain amount of that before you're allowed in, and you probably won't be allowed in, and actually most people are really aware that you're kind of a lay person, you're not really in the art world, you know, but we're going to show you some art, and you can kind of be in awe of that art, and you can look up to it, and then you can buy an umbrella with a print of that art, on it and you can walk around with it but those people are always going to be a bit like oh wow art you know i wish i could do that or you know or something there's certainly a feeling of that being something special you know a bit like when you go in a church and things feeling kind of untouchable um and there being a certain mystery so yeah certainly you know certainly a number of people are going to look at that and, and and get inspired by it and then want to be an artist and and that's kind of where the trouble might begin that's where the trouble begins for many of them because it's like that's a life of lifetime of destitution and disappointment um apart from those few who who get really wealthy but then i think that the ones who get really wealthy and do really well are probably pretty cynical themselves they're probably pretty jaded and fed up with the whole thing um but yeah you know um just to be cynical but Here's a thing there. It says how to get into art parties. A guide. Just to kind of looking at this. Oh, but actual fact, it's not even. A th oh no, it is. It is a thing. I thought actually I've been tricked. And it's not. You can't even click through it. And I've been. I'm kind of become part of the joke. Okay, you can click through it. So how to get into parties? A guide. Art parties. A guide. I haven't actually looked at this yet. But I thought it might be fun to go through because it kind of also probably brings us on to the elitism of the art world. How to get into art parties? A guide. Um, I should be on the guest list, the invite. Um, I don't really know what they're getting at here. Okay, uh, it's an invite on a phone. Okay, um, all right, there's a number of things you can say. So when you get to the door of the art party and you can't get in, you might say something like, we're with... And then you set up the name of the artist. So you're like, oh, I'm with Damien Hurst. Let me in. Um, I'm one of the artists. That might get you in. Uh, I'm from insert big institution. So I think you know you might say Tate Modern, but you might say Freeze Magazine, the actual, the real Freeze Magazine. That always worked. But I was working for Freeze Magazine when I did it. But the thing is, if they suspect that you're not, then you're in trouble. I think they, they so people often check these kind of things. Do you know Christine? Uh, just something random like that. Uh, show a screenshot of an email. I forgot my phone or just slowly walk past the reception. Actually, when it was coming up to the Venice Biennale, I was getting these invites for these exclusive openings. And they were just the emails saying, you know, Leah Rimmer would be delighted if you would join would join uh, us for the opening of uh, Gian Maria Tazzati's Italian Pavilion. It just occurred to me I could have sent that to anyone. It might have my name at the top, but I'm still pretty sure... You know, the email probably would have sufficed for nearly anyone to get in. So I don't know. I mean, there is this thing of like exclusivity. I think you often find that you know they only want to keep the numbers down. Um, they, yeah. they certainly they don't, they don't want anyone in, but they, they're banking on largely mostly people who come will be people with it who have been invited. So you're immediately cutting out the hoi polloi, i.e. the mass, i.e. you're know, stopping like some homeless person coming in and nicking the champagne. Um, but beyond that. They don't really mind as long as they get the 200 people coming. Yeah, I would just add to that that like, I think this press pass idea can work pretty well. So if there's any art, artists or people interested in the arts out there that are trying to 
to get in for free. I would say I've heard I've heard that like if you make a little press card and you put you know your photo fo- you know you have your photo and it just says like theory and practice on it, put it around your neck you know look professional then maybe that will get you in. Maybe Mike maybe you can send a little a little uh, JPEG of theory and practice that people can print out in color and stick it inside. Yeah. Or, or down down and out in the art world. In fact, look, I've got one here. With Podcast my... name. Oh, yeah, whatever that thing is called. Uh, uh, lanyard. For some reason, they call those things lanyards. Or, it's a strange or, name. A, or a student card. You know, I mean, students can get into stuff because you could say that, you know, it's part of your research project or something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't, I don't think they're particularly trying to keep everyone out, but they just don't want everyone in. You know, they don't, they don't, they're not like, you know, you can't come in at all, but they're a bit like, you know, we want a certain, you know, level of middle-class art world people in our shows. We don't want just any person turning up. Then they can get kind of weird. I was thrown out at the Finnish Pavilion party once in around 2013, me and an artist I was working with. The security guys who were from a local quite serious security firm Somehow, for some reason, I like I already knew who these guys were, because I think we we our artwork we were we were planning was was based around security concerns. So we ended up googling local security companies, and we got this one that had like ex soldiers and stuff running it, and you actually have photos of these people that you know they could that could be chosen, um, to you know to uh, that you know you could you could hire this security guard or this security guard. And somehow I was like, oh shit, I think I know this guy. And, and they were serious guys, they were ex-army. And they just decided they didn't want me and this artist in, in the exhibition opening anymore. And I was writing for a number of prominent art magazines at the time, and I was creating at that Biennale. And my friend knew the Finnish culture minister, um, not the guy I was getting chucked out with, but another friend, Finnish guy who was there. But they were just like, no, you're going out. We don't want you here. And they just, something to do with our clothes, something to do with the way we were speaking. Maybe we looked like we drunk too much, but I don't think we had at that point um and that was interesting so i think yeah they, they want a certain type of person that they're openings on the whole and actually i think that is that the end of like this little routine of how to get in yeah so yeah, i guess so the, I thing, the thing before oh, why am i like, unable to click now on any oh no hang on because you click these things on the far side okay Oh no, there you go. This is part of the same sequence. Venice Biennale would be like you come across an acquaintance on the street, small talk for 90 seconds, awkward silence, let's catch up soon. Ah, it's actually, this is one of the following memes. All right, I'm just being so meme illiterate or Instagram illiterate today. Anyway, it's one of the following memes. Um, so that's what happens at the Biennale. Yeah, it's pretty awful. Yeah. And they mean the Biennale opening, opening weekend. Um, there's everyone from the art world there and you have to basically end up talking to people you don't want to talk to. Okay, I'll just be like, I know a spot and then take you here. Okay, I guess it's more just a comment on creepy artists. Or I know what it's really commenting on, it's just, I guess, artists, after, I suppose after openings or some point, be like, hey, come back and drink something, then they'll be like, take you to some dingy squat or something. Yeah, they're all they all seem quite ambivalent. These and very quickly, very quickly made, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all very simple stuff. Um, I mean, I suppose they're kind of funny, and it's just consistency and and the fact of the artist using the name Freeze Magazine, um, which I suppose seems kind of uh, uh, somehow it's like sticking two fingers up. Or one finger, you know, it's like it's like sticking, it's like making a swear sign at the establishment, you know. Um, so yeah, um, how long has this, has this account been going? I think if we scroll down, we'd be scrolling forever. Instagram is a bit is a bit like annoying. This post the, is gen, generally fourteen. It? It's a bit difficult to navigate Instagram on a on a laptop or desktop it's really like they really want you to be using yeah. your phone don't they there's a the yeah well no there it is upload now um you can upload to a desktop now which you couldn't before uh i know i'm trying to find like the beginning of this page but it could be scrolling for a long time so i'm not gonna bother now but i'd say it's been going for a fair time 
Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's quite a funny page. I think it's, it does its job well of poking fun at the art world. It's got the it's got the Mike Watson stamp of approval. This meme account. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good meme account. But I'm not sure they would care. Uh, I think they. I'm not sure they should care even. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's good. Yeah, so for, you know, given my experience in memes in the art world, yeah, this one will do. Um, I mean, I think. Uh, I've been mean, talking. The thing that we're talking about is like our memes. Our memes, the new art world. And I think the thing is, they are the new art world. If you're talking about an art world being a world of art for the whole world, you know, art being for all, then the art world's definitely is. It hands. It hands. It hands down lost at that aim. Um, so is L from Discord reminds me of philosophy Twitter. Yeah, it, it is a bit like that. Yeah, it's just a comment we have coming in. Um, so, is it is it also Michael? Just I just wanted to say sorry to interrupt you. Um, is it also like another example of what we were saying earlier on, where the art world is trying to incorporate other other parts of culture? Like meme culture is kind of like comedy as well, isn't it? Right. It's it's almost like visual stand-up, isn't it? Yeah, unless it's political. But yeah, on the whole, I think it, it's based around jokes, yeah. Um, meme culture is, yeah, but then not everything that is memed, nothing that becomes a meme in the literal sense of a viral image is, um, you know, c comes from this sphere of, like, you know, funny JPEGs that we call memes, of course. A lot of them are related to fashion and revolve around people like the Kardashians. Um, but yeah, the, the, what you're, yeah, what we're talking about now is this kind of meme that we're looking at that has come to be known literally as a meme, or internet meme. Um, they tend to be funny, yeah, and I suppose that is something that the art world would like to kind of like embrace. Um, but you know, going back to what I'm saying, what I was saying, you know, in terms of the, the central question of this episode, are memes becoming the new art world? They are becoming the new art world if the art world is a space where people make art in the world. That in most of what's made, I guess, now, most of what's made is made as, as internet memes or otherwise other types of internet posts that could become memes. Uh, and, and of course, you can incorporate also YouTube into that. So this is where creativity is happening more than more than the art world. And the art world won't ever co-opt that. I don't think it's too big for the art world to co-opt, but the art world won't give up its hold on art, its exclusivity, because it's a business that, that it's like it's like fine wine actually it's like this whole thing of you need you need a whole industry of wine tasters and um connoisseurs who will attest to this wine being better than that wine and actually at the higher levels apparently there well, there's been blind testing done several times that have shown that the the experts don't know what they're talking about that if they keep being given the same wine again and again but told it's a different wine they will keep writing down completely different wine notes, completely different tasting notes. Um, I'm reading a book now in which this is mentioned. Um, and it's the same with basically, it's the same with a lot of fields actually, that when you get to the higher levels, you can't really distinguish between things in terms of quality. So what you need, is you need a number of um, experts who will, who will claim that this or that, you know, artist is better, or this or that wine or, or whatever. So, um, I mean, that's essential because um, because people are trying to make money out of it. Uh, and so you obviously need a, a very strict strata mechanism of stratification where you're saying this one is better than that one is better than that one. So you can justify paying this much for a certain one. Now, the meme, uh, memes won't, don't lend themselves to that. So it will never be admitted that, that you know, the, the meme world is the world where art is happening now. But the other question that we have really is going back to the beginning: is it does like is there, is there, is there a, an issue of quality raised, or is there a crisis of quality raised by there being too many, uh, being so many people making memes? And I guess you say it's too early to see if quality has been improved or uh, heightened or or lessened uh, by the amount of artists there are today in the art world. And I agree if I agree on why you said it, but 
you know, if we think to what is, is considered to be great now from the, um, should we say, the Baroque period, you can look at Velasquez and say, well, that's great. But I don't know that everyone then was saying Velasquez is the greatest artist. There would have been a number of, 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 of other contenders. But now Velasquez comes to mind immediately. Um, so certainly I don't think now we can say, you know, to what degree art has improved given the amount of extra artists there are in operation. But if you apply that to memes rather than the art world, I don't know where we are, because I would say quite definitely the quality has dropped if you're thinking about quality in the old aesthetic terms. And what would you say about that? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, OK, well, that was concise. I, I wish I could be that concise. Now I'm, I'm, I'm out of breath now. I, I'm, I hardly took a breath for the last three minutes. Well, maybe we should um, bring it to an end now. Well, yeah, OK. Um, although I want to just say one more thing about that, that is that if you're talking about, you know, are, do memes match the quality of the art world and of the art world historically, uh, of, of artists historically, um i think we have to we have to realign what we mean by quality or what we're looking for um i think you can have a situation where many many more people are engaged in an activity and the quality declines in the old sense but you are given something in another sense um i suppose that is a sense of democracy so to speak although it's an inadequate term but i guess what we do get is um we get a situation actually where if so, you cite like, has this kind of thing of like monkeys on computers. If you had like um, infinite amount of monkeys for an infinite amount of time writing on on on, they used to say typewriters. And actually, I haven't heard it in the computer age. It's gone almost disappeared, probably because it's almost what's happening. But if you had an infinite amount of monkeys typing on their phones or on laptops for an infinite amount of time, one of them would end up writing out the Bible in, in complete order. That's something that's said. Uh, it used to be said a lot. It used to be said when people were stoned or drunk. It always came up every night you went out, nearly, if you were around people who like talking about philosophy. Um, and that's the thing, because what you'd also get is you'd get a number of things that weren't the Bible that were probably even better, or, you know, better than Ulysses or better than works of Shakespeare. And that would be the benefit in having, um, you know, infinite amount of monkeys typing for an infinite amount of time on computers. And in a way, that's what the meme sphere is much more than what the art world is. So, you know, that's where maybe the policy could get thrown up accidentally because you just have so many people producing stuff. And I think, you know, that is worth considering. Um, and you're right, yeah, maybe we should wrap up. That's my final thought. I'm Mike Watson. I've been here with Bobby Dowler. We are down and out in the art world and we've been speaking about memes and the art world and looking at the account Fleas underscore magazine on Instagram we're uh, very thankful to our viewers and yep see you shortly see you when we next broadcast okay bye everyone bye bye